Good evening and welcome to Lowell Observatory's ongoing celebration of our Lowell Discovery Telescope. It's been 10 years since the Lowell Discovery Telescope or LDT as we um, refer to it as, um, since it's our first light. And since then our scientists and technicians have um, made this telescope operate to look at some of the deepest areas of the universe. Um, throughout this year, every month, we've had different astronomers and um, technical folks on board to hear about the telescope and what it does, what it's capable of doing, um, and the future of it. And uh, tonight, we, we have just an outstanding um, guest with us, Dr. Kyler Keen. Um, he, fits, he fits kind of all the molds. When you think about a little Discovery Telescope, there's the technical side, you know, just making an instrument like this work. And then there's, you know, what you do with it, doing the science. Well, Kyler does both. He's the director of technology here at the observatory. So he oversees management of the observatory science telescopes and related instruments. But in his spare time, uh, as it were, he also actively does research. And his research is really, I think, remarkable and global. We were just talking before the program that Kyler has, has carried out research himself in five continents. And, and, and so the, this research really is global partnerships all over the place. And that's something we'll talk about a little bit tonight. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our scientists in LDT, how they're part of, you know, they're standalone outstanding instruments and scientists, but they're part of networks also um, that allow us to really maximize and do the greatest amount of science we can. So, so Kyler, welcome tonight. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. And um, I, you know, it's just, you know, everybody has such a great background. You've got, you certainly have one uh, besides your time in Ohio, which I had to point out because that's where I'm from. Yeah. Um, you've done research, Wait. like I said, all over the place. So maybe just let's hear a little bit about your background and, you know, first how you got interested in astronomy and then maybe just some, some of the highlights of the grand tour of Kyler. Um, your career. Sure. So yeah, uh, born in Ohio, grew up there. I was actually, I, I really liked math and science when I was young, but honestly, I was more interested in chemistry to start. I had a friend who had a home-built telescope, um, but I would sort of, yeah, that was neat. I'd look through it sometimes, but mostly we would play with his chemistry set in his backyard and, and burn down his picnic table uh, by mixing chemicals. So I was, I was definitely a scientist at the time, um, if by a scientist, I mean, let's see what happens when I do this with chemicals. Um, it wasn't until college um, that I really focused on astronomy. My older brother was a, a physics major. He was studying at Cornell University. And then I, when I applied to go to the University of Southern California, I thought, ah, physics sounds nice, I'll do that. So then I, that was my major. I took all the physics courses and it was, um, Sophomore year of college, I was in my friend's lab. He was giving me a tour, showing me his research. And the first clear pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope came out. And the instant I saw those, that's when I decided that's what I want to do with my life. So as cool as his, his lab was, and, you know, whatever he was doing, it was the astronomy that grabbed me right then and there. Um, so then I, I sort of, I was working in a um, condensed matter physics lab at the time, and I kept working there, but my summers that I would go and do uh, research at Prince for undergraduates, um, focused on astronomy. I went to graduate school at the University of California in Irvine. Um, because of their um, optical telescopes, the University of California has access to some fantastic resources. So I thought there's a bunch of different projects there that I could work on. And I ended up working on one that was not even on my radar at all when I went. Um, the faculty had uh, pizza luncheon with the new graduate students every Friday. And there would be a, a new professor every week telling us about the research. And when I heard about neutrino astronomy, I thought, wow, this is the coolest thing ever. You bury light detectors in the ice of the South Pole and you see particles that are coming up from the Northern Hemisphere all the way through the Earth. And then you look back um, on the sky and try to see where they're coming from and what, what that matches up with on the sky. That's amazing, I wanna do that. 
So that uh, turned into working with the Antarctic muon and neutrino detector array, Amanda, and then that was uh, upgraded to the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory. Um, and so that required me to do both uh, astronomy, astrophysics, and um, and particle physics. So I, I sort of did two, I mean, it was one PhD, but it was in two fields sort of combined. And that's what got me my postdoctoral research position with the dark energy camera. Went back to uh, Columbus, I uh, got a postdoc at the Ohio State University, where they were building the dark energy camera. And this was a large scale astronomy instrument, but it was borrowing a lot of techniques from high energy physics, just with the, the volume of data and the sort of um, the way they were doing the analysis. Um, so they wanted someone with experience in both fields, and that was me. Um, so I went from uh, Ohio State and then helped build the precursor to the dark energy camera at Argonne National Laboratory, uh, just outside of Chicago. And that's when I started switching seriously from uh, doing data analysis to uh, instrumentation. I did not actually um, build the instrument at the South Pole. I was focused on the data analysis. So that was what my PhD was about, was looking for neutrinos from a particular type of star that explodes called a gamma ray burst. But then later on in my career is when I got into instrumentation and that got me then the next job at the Australian Astronomical Observatory, um, working on a, uh, the Starbug fiber positioners, and I'll, I can show you some pictures of those later if you like. Those are really cool. Let's say um, coaxial piezo ceramic tube. You stick an optical fiber in the middle of those, and then they flex and bend and walk across the uh, the focal surface of a telescope, and. That is what uh, allows you to position this optical fiber at whatever you want to look at in the sky. You can have 10 of these or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 at once to look at many, many different objects. So this was a technology research and development project where I was both in the lab and I was managing the project as a whole doing budgets and schedules and stuff like that. And then that part of the job is what got me the director of technology position at Lowell. And I moved more into um, more into science management, although as Kevin said, I, I'll, I also have a bit of time for my own research. So it's a fairly circuitous career path, not what I would have predicted ahead of time, but each step sort of along the way made sense at the time. It's, it's like, a, you always look at these things, it's like a maze, you know, you do uh, in the newspaper where if you start at the beginning, you take a few false starts, but if you go to the end and go backwards, it makes sense how you got there. Mm -hmm. And it seems like you, every step of the way, added on and, and you ended up where you are today because of that. Yep. So, so you ended up here at Lowell Observatory. And of course our program's about the Lowell Discovery Telescope. And that's one of your babies that you oversee. Um, yep. And I should point out that we call it the Lowell Discovery Telescope or LDT, but when it was built 10 years ago, it was called the Discovery Channel Telescope um, because of a partnership with Discovery Communications who put in a, the naming um, amount of money um, and since then, the, the name has changed just to better identify um, that Lowell is, is involved with it and, and in fact owns it, while um, Discovery, of course, is still um, a partner of ours. Um, and, and this is something you can talk about also. You know, we, we've, we've spoken throughout the year about the different research, and we've mentioned science partners, and we have science partners at several different universities. How does that work, and what's the, what's the value of that? Um, so the way it works is we have partners who um, ask to use our telescope and they pay basically the operations cost for the nights that they use. So our Lowell scientists use about half the time on the telescope. Then we have partnership with Boston University, Yale, uh, Maryland, Toledo, and Northern Arizona University. And they split the other half of their time amongst themselves. Um, so like Maryland has their own science interests and Yale has their own science interests and so on. And so they get to come and use our instruments for things that, that we wouldn't be doing. It really increases the scientific productivity of the telescope. Um, we don't have enough scientists to really use all of it full time. Um, and there's just, there's so much other science out there that they can do that our people aren't working on. So that's what the, that's where the partners come in. 
and they can do their own science and some of them bring their own instruments um, to, to do their science as well that we, we put on our telescope. And we're gonna talk about uh, some of those tonight. And uh, earlier this year, as we've had these um, ser this LDT series, we've talked about research with the LDT with, uh, from the inner solar system through icy bodies in the outer solar system, um, stars and galaxies and such. And tonight we're gonna to go a bit further out. I, I should also mention that another project that um, the LDT has been used for and is being used for you know, right now is, is for the DART mission, um, which is that spacecraft, the DART spacecraft is gonna be impacting um, the asteroid moon on, on September 26th. And the LDT, um, and it's not the only one, there are other telescopes around the world, but it's been used to, to um, pinpoint the, the, the orbit of, of that asteroid system and also after impact to look at it again to see how the orbits change. So the telescope is used for just a really great variety of things. And I'm really interested in talking to you tonight because we haven't touched on, on this research yet throughout the series. Um, but I think you have to give a little background information first. Um, maybe talk about your project called the S5 that kind of got you going in this direction of research and then how that applies to the LDT. Yeah, so uh, S5 is the Southern Stellar Stream Spectroscopic Survey. So what that means is we, we look at uh, what used to be galaxies, smaller galaxies that were orbiting the Milky Way, and the Milky Way's gravity has pulled them apart into basically like spaghetti, long streams of stars are being pulled off of, of these other smaller galaxies and into the Milky Way. So that's what a stellar stream is, and it can be, it can sort of orbit all the way around the Milky Way, so we can have these very long streams across the whole sky. And this was originally started uh, in the Southern Hemisphere using the Anglo-Australian Telescope, and I'm extending it into the North using LDT. And so what, what we originally did was um, found these streams using the dark energy camera, and that's how I got involved. We were using the camera that I helped build, so it was part of the project that I was already involved in. And then we decided, well, we can sort of see these stars being pulled out of the um, out of these other galaxies and feeding into the Milky Way, but how do we know which exact ones are members, what, how quickly are they being pulled in? And then if we measure some stars over here and some stars over here, we can effectively weigh the Milky Way. We can determine how much gravity is pulling these stars in. And it turns out it, um, we, we knew this before we started this project, that there's a lot of mass that isn't just in stars. There's particles that are called dark matter, and that's um, a large fraction of the, the mass of the Milky Way is in the dark matter, and we can't see it, but we can measure its effects. And that's what we're going to try to do with this Southern Stellar Stream Spectroscopic Survey. So what spectroscopy means is we are not just looking at the stars and taking a picture of them and saying, yes, you know, here's a stream going across the sky, but we're, we're looking at effectively their chemical fingerprint, and you can spread, split the light up into a different colors of the rainbow. And if you see a bright spike at um, one particular color or a dip in another color, we can say this, this is the chemical calcium, or this is hydrogen, or this is magnesium, or europium. We can identify all the different chemical elements that way. And also we can see by how, they're, how these colors shift we can determine the velocity of that star relative to us. So we can see, oh, it's moving towards us at a thousand kilometers a second or something like that. And then that then feeds into, if we get enough of these stars in enough locations, we can measure um, the velocity and that tells us how quickly it's, things are being pulled into the Milky Way, what the Milky Way's gravitational potential is, how much mass there is. And not just that, but if they're sort of being pulled in faster over here, and over here, maybe the mass is clumpy. There's more dark matter over here than down here. So that's that's sort of qualitatively the sort of thing we're doing with uh, the S5 project. And you know, I, I just want to cut in for a second. You know, this is this is to me so low observatory because we've been operating since 1894, uh, doing cutting edge research since then, 
and this it's this heritage of cutting edge research. And there's so many projects that they go back to early days. You know, of course, the search for a ninth planet that led to the discovery of Pluto mm -hmm. um, and scientists today, Will Grundy, for instance, is still very actively involved in, in, re, in Pluto research and is a key member of the New Horizons mission, for instance. And then I think of dark matter and the early discovery of dark matter um, and the lobes of retarded ties. Uh, maybe, do you want to touch on that a little bit or I can, whichever, but it's, you it's might just, know a bit again, it's that it's was Using the, the Perkins telescope, um, this was uh, Vera Rubin, who um, is quite famous. She now has, has a, a whole observatory named after her that's just coming online soon. And so she was one of the ones who used Lowell Observatory telescopes um, to, uh, th there was this idea of dark matter was hypothesized previously, and I think other people were working on it as well. And they could see that as you sort of go out from a galaxy, they thought that, well, you're outside all the mass, you're getting farther away, these stars should orbit slower because there's not as much gravitational force pulling on these stars. It turns out when they actually measured the what's called the rotation curve, as they went farther and farther out, it didn't drop off like they were expected. It sort of stayed the same. And that meant there was more mass there than what could be seen in just the stars. And that's what was called dark matter. That's one of the one of the first bits of evidence we had for it. And that was that was what the 19 late 1960s yeah, in the 60s. First started detecting that, but it's really only been in recent years that you've been able to really kind of get a handle on, you know, explaining what it is, right? Right, so we still haven't, we can't point to something and say, okay, there's a piece of dark matter. Um, but it's, it's a kind of nice having this particle physics background as well, because honestly, in particle physics with our colliders, we smash atoms together and we, in some ways we detect new particles all the time. So it's not surprising that there's this other particle out there that we just haven't detected yet. We haven't got the energy range or resolution to see it yet. But like I said before, we can see the effects of it. Everything that has mass has a gravitational effect and that's what we're observing. So yeah, we can start talking about its properties, um, sort of what, maybe not how much a dark matter particle weighs, but the sort of collective effects it has on the on galactic scales or even on cosmological scales. It turns out that um, the matter we can see, the matter we're made up of, you know, stars and uh, planets and everything, that's only about 5% of the, the effective mass energy of the universe. Dark matter is another 25%. So there's five times as much dark matter as regular matter. Um, we're not going to get into dark energy at all. I can talk about that um, a whole different night. But um, all this sort of feeds into cosmology and how the, the universe as a whole is formed and how galaxies form out of that. So as Kevin said, we're, we started with sort of the, the planetary and the solar system and I'm, I'm taking us out to the larger scales, the whole universe. And that's what the dark energy camera was intended to, to do was sort of understand cosmology as a whole, how the universe evolved from its earliest stages to, to now. And that is done by, uh, a couple of different ways, including measuring how galaxies interact. And on a small scale, what's called near field cosmology is measuring that sort of effect just with the Milky Way and its its nearest neighbors. We can do that on much larger scales with galaxy clusters across the whole universe and supernovae uh, halfway across the universe and stuff like that. But we can get a handle on uh, the galaxy formation part of cosmology just by looking at the Milky Way and its environment and how these galaxies sort of fall in and their stars get pulled into the Milky Way. And I think one of the discussions we had was sort of calling this galactic trash or galactic flotsam or something, but I sort of prefer to think of it as um, a galactic construction project because that is how galaxies form and grow as they, they pull in matter from outside, including stars and other galaxies. So that's really what we're seeing is the way that galaxies are assembled throughout the universe by, by measuring these stellar streams falling into the Milky Way. And so you really are answering questions well beyond our own galaxy. 
um, it, you know, our, our universe neighborhood, really. And, and the more we understand dark matter from the local universe, the more we can extrapolate to what it's done across the entire universe as well. And it's, it's remarkable what technology can do for you. Uh, mm -hmm. Astronomy, certainly, you know, it, it hasn't been that long ago that we knew of the nine, um, you know, traditional planets in our solar system. And then, you know, scientists predicted there are others out there, but we'd have technology. Now we're finding them left and right or mm -hmm. around other stars. And, and the same with this. Like you said, we, with the technology, you can see so much further and I mean, you can really spread your wings on, on explaining more of the universe um, further and further away from us. Mm -hmm. Now, and we, I'll just point out, um, we have a couple of questions coming in. We'll get to those at appropriate times, but for those watching, um, certainly if you have any questions throughout, um, send them in and we'll get to them um, at one point or another. Um, my name is Kevin Schindler. I'm the Historian and Public Information Officer here at Lowell Observatory. And I'm with Dr. Kyla Keene, the Director of Technology, who is both a technology and research god at the observatory. Um, we're pleased to have him up here tonight um, talking about um, your work with um, at Lowell Observatory in general and then specifically with Lowell Discovery Telescope. Mm -hmm. um, so you were mentioning, you, you were introducing us to the S5 um, project. And let's, mm -hmm. let's now move forward to you come to Lowell Observatory and how you've adapted um, using the LDT for that research. Right. So I mentioned we're originally uh, the stellar stream would be detected with a dark energy camera, which just takes pictures and can see because there's stars stretching across the sky. And then the Anglo-Australian telescope would look at them and take spectra of them and say, okay, this one's moving this direction. This one is moving over there. It's not actually part of the stellar stream. Let's leave it out. So a lot of it was what we call target selection, figuring out which ones are the stream numbers to measure the, the um, understand how they're moving into the Milky Way. And then, so that's um, a resolution of 10,000. That's sort of a technical term, resolution. But what it means is we take the entire optical spectrum of light from sort of red to purple, and we split it up into 10,000 different chunks. And each of those chunks might have the light from one particular chemical element in it. And that's how we identify the chemicals. That's how we identify how fast something is moving. So that is, I guess what's called medium resolution. A low resolution spectrum helps it spread the light out into about a thousand different colors. Um, the AT does up to 10,000 and Express does 150,000. Um, so I think that's a color resolution that might be better than the human eye. I don't know how many different shades of color the human eye can, can detect, but what it does is it, it has a much finer, um, it, it can see much subtler shifts um, in, in these, these colors of light and in these chemical elements that are, are shifting back and forth as something moves. So for example, our resolution, we're interested in a couple of kilometers per second, how fast these stars are moving towards or away from us. Um, the express spectrograph on LDT, one of our instruments, uh, is looking to measure things moving at about 10 centimeters a second. So that's less, that's the pretty slow walking speed. That's like the speed my three-year-old daughter walks when she's sort of ambling down the sidewalk, checking out rocks and flowers and stuff. So we can see stars moving something like 10 centimeters a second. And what that means is um, there's a gravitational pull between a star and a planet. The planet's much, much smaller, so it's not going to pull on the star much. But if it pulls on it, you know, such that it moves 10 centimeters in a second, Express can see that. So this is um, what, what the uh, Express team initially built the, this extreme precision spectrometer, that's what Express stands for. They were intending to look at planets around other stars and just see this slight pull from the gravity of the planet. And I'm actually taking that and, and adapting it to looking at these stars outside of our galaxy. Um, so it's much, much fainter than anything that they were trying to look at, but I also don't quite need the same 
resolution. I don't need the same level of detail. But what I am doing is I'm measuring the chemical content and the velocity of these stars much, much better than the Anglo-Australian telescope was. And we have other partners that are doing this with, say, the Magellan Telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. But I'm one of the only ones working on this in the Northern Hemisphere. And some of these stellar streams that we've seen in the South, it turns out, are also extending into the Northern Hemisphere, so we can measure them up here as well. And what's, what, there's one in particular that's very interesting. It sort of has a, a particular track in the Southern Hemisphere. And the Northern Hemisphere track is slightly misaligned. It's off by like a degree. So we had to figure out what happened. And we had a, one of the people in our research collaboration um, did a simulation of this stellar stream, this galaxy basically falling into the Milky Way. And it turns out he simulated the, I think it was the Large Magellan Cloud, another one of Mil the Milky Way satellite galaxies passing nearby. And it perturbed this, this stream. It put a kink in it. That was something like a degree. So that's sort of the, the sort of thing we think happened. It wasn't just stuff falling into the Milky Way, but it was another smaller galaxy passing nearby that gave us this effect that we observed, this, this shift in the position of the, the stars that are falling into the Milky Way. So there's a lot of details. It's really an interesting sort of forensic analysis, I guess, of what's been gone on in the last billion years as these stars have been falling into the Milky Way. And I think this is just such a great topic, I think, because, you know, as we've talked about the LDT throughout the year, you know, a lot of the research was in the original design of, of that telescope and instruments, but, but this is an example of having a powerful telescope and powerful instrument and adapting it to something that wasn't planned. And it turns out it's, it's, it's ideal for the work. Um, and that's, that says something about the adaptability of the LDT and the instruments of it. Yeah, and I am pushing Express beyond what they originally intended it to do, but it's it's still working. It, it does take a bit longer to look at fainter stars. Express is looking at stars that uh, you can't see the planets around the stars, but you can see the stars with the naked eye, uh, some of them, some of the brighter ones. Um, but I'm looking at stars that are, I think something like 10,000 times fainter than that. Um, much, much fainter. So it's harder to do it with Express, but I've, over the last couple of years, I've completed observations for about five different stars with this extremely high resolution. So that'll be interesting to, to see and compare. It's a smaller number of stars than the thousands that S5 has detected, but we have much, much greater detail on their chemical composition and their, their velocity and things like that. So it's it's very complementary to what the rest of this the project is doing. So how many how many team members are on this project, and how does how does the other observations um, compare to LDTs? How do they complement each other? Um, there are about forty people in uh, the S five collaboration. Most of them are in Australia. We've got a few people in other places like me. I've, I started it when I was in Australia and have since moved to here. Other collaborators, one in Toronto. Um, but yeah, most of the observing is actually done um, with the Anglo-Australian telescope. We have, as I mentioned, there are others who use uh, other high resolution instruments on like the Magellan telescope. I think that collaborator is from Caltech or Carnegie Observatories or something like that. Um, so what, what we're going to do with this is we have the, the sort of low and medium resolution that just identifies these stars and gets their, the, their general properties. And the high resolution can give us much more detail about, like I said, the chemical composition. So we can identify, oh, this star has this chemical element. That means it was formed in this way. Um, there was a supernova that occurred in this um, satellite galaxy beforehand that, that produced this element that we now find in this star. So it can give us more information about the, the history of these, these stars, how they formed, what environment they formed in, and also get more accurate uh, velocities. And that will help us, um, the velocity then correlates with how, how hard the Milky Way is tugging on it. So it will help us more accurately way the Milky Way and understand the clumpiness of the dark matter in the Milky Way as well. And then that, how the dark matter clumps can then tell us a bit about the particle physics of dark matter itself. 
And what, what kind of sample sizes are you talking about? I mean, you're obviously observing more than one because one observation may think of just be an anomaly. So right. how many different things do you look at? So the uh, S5 project uh, using the Anglo Australian Telescope can see about 300 stars at once, between three and 400. And we've taken, um, we've looked at 12 different stellar streams. Each one has had a couple of dozen pointings along the length of the stream. So I would say hundreds of thousands of stars with that, um, with sort of the overall survey. And then the high resolution, we'll, we're following up just a handful. I've got five. The people using Magellan are, have maybe 20 or 30, something like that. So it's, it's dozens, it's not thousands for the, the high resolution. But um, like I said, that, that gives us a, a different set of information. Mm -hmm. Now, what's, what's the connection? Let's kind of take a different angle here. With You've done some work with um, dismember star clusters. Um, yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit. So that's um, that was sort of initially where this um, Southern Stellar Stream Spectroscopic Survey started out, not not working on streams, but working on just uh, these satellite galaxies of the Milky Way, usually called dwarf galaxies. So these were first discovered uh, orbiting around the Milky Way by the dark energy camera. Um, so then we went and looked at these and wanted to um, get more information about those. So we looked at just the, the galaxies that were sort of intact. And then we found, um, after we looked for longer, we found some of these are actually being pulled apart. Some of these have tidal streams that show they're being dismembered by the, the gravity of the Milky Way. Some of them were already pulled completely apart. There's not a galaxy anymore. There's just this stream. So it went from the galaxies, we sort of built the initial collaboration around that. And then we just kept going and expanding our, our scientific repertoire. And so we went from galaxies to streams. And now we're sort of doing those that are in between where there's still some galaxy left, but we're, uh, the fainter and fainter we look, we're starting to see more and more galaxies with the, that are starting to be pulled apart. So they've got a little bit of sort of loose threads coming off of stars. And it, it was really hard to see at first because the, um, there's just this little bit of stars coming off is so much fainter. But the more we observe, the more we, the fainter we can see. And so we're starting to get these sort of hybrids where there's still galaxies, but also also have the start, uh, these tidal tails or the starts of the stellar streams to them. It's really remarkable when you think, you know, it hasn't been that long ago that there are, there are pretty basic elements of the universe you know, the solar system with, you know, star, planet, moons, asteroids, comets, further out, you know, globular star clusters, open clusters. But it seems like there's all these weird um, kind of a look, you know, they're kind of a combination things that we're finding in recent years. And I, I like that. That's one of the things I like about Lowell is just the history we have of, of expanding our view. When um, the, basically the first, Branch of these, these first, um, what, what turned out to be uh, other galaxies were observed um, by our scientists. And they were, you know, I, that led to Hubble's discovery of the expanding universe and so on. Um, and so these, these things that um, nobody had seen before, there's a long heritage of that in, with Lowell, there's um, interstellar dust. Was, was one of the things that was discovered um, here as well. And so just these, these different classes of things that we, we had no idea existed. Um, we thought, you know, maybe these are just, you know, more globular clusters um, in the Milky Way. No, it turns out they're completely outside our, our galaxy. They're, you know, a billion times farther away than anything in our, our galaxy. So that, just the, the fact that we can continue to sort of expand the scale of our knowledge and expand the sort of things we can learn about the universe is, is amazing to me. And honestly, it's a, it's a, it's a religious experience for me as well. <laughs> and you know, it, it reminds me of one of the things that our um, Lowell Putnam, our sole trustee here at the observatory, um, has said on many occasions about doing research at Lowell that um, the scientists here um, are open to choose paths of research that they're interested in. I mean, also that by owning our own telescopes, 
there's the there's the availability of telescopes. Yep. Um, and maybe speak to that a little bit. Um, yeah, so that's that's part of what the technology group is that I'm in charge of. Um, we make sure that um, the way I like to put it is we, we give our scientists as many photons as possible. So we want to make sure that the telescopes are all operating. We, we're we building a new telescope. We've got our, our big one, the LDT, is a four meter um, aperture. That's a, the size of the light collecting is four meters in diameter. We're getting a new one meter telescope for things where we don't need to look as at as faint of an object, but we need to control 100% of the telescope time and just observe at, you know, maybe a nightly cadence over and over and over, things like monitoring asteroids or uh, Titan or things like that. So that's, there, there's a lot of different ways of doing observing. There's getting big telescopes to look at faint objects. There's getting um, smaller telescopes to look at brighter objects, but more regularly. And that's the sort of thing that the technology group enables, whether that's our night operation staff who work at the telescopes every night, or our engineers who maintain the telescopes during the day and our technical facilities people, um, or our uh, instrumentation people too. That's another thing that, uh, even going back to Principal Lowell and Besto Slifer, they, um, Carl Leblin, they developed new technology to do new observations. And I, I think I'm especially enamored of Lamplin, who did some of the first uh, infrared observations from Lowell. And that was an extremely difficult measurement to make, extremely fiddly instrument. But he did it, and he. Um, there were some things that kind of led him astray, like measuring the temperature of Mars to be right around freezing with his um, infrared um, measuring device. I think that was a bit off, but that sort of fed into the idea of, oh, there's Martian civilizations that are collapsing because their world is is freezing and they're retreating down into the, you know, canyons and trying to maintain these canals and stuff. So, where they went with that was a bit. Well, wrong, but but the instrumentation is is just fascinating. How much they could do, and I guess how much we've built upon that as a whole astronomical community, and, and in particular at Lowell. And I like that that heritage that we have here. That, that that I'm trying to continue with our instrument group. Like I said, we're getting this new telescope. We're going to be building a second generation of instruments for the LDT eventually. We're just starting to plan for that with our partners as well. It's, it's hard to imagine, you know, where it seems like the LDT just opened and of course it's been 10 years now, but, but already planning for the next instruments, like you said, and it takes a while to develop these things, um, mm -hmm. certainly, and raise the money and do everything else. Yep. Now, so what does a typical day look, look like for you if there is such a thing? Because you're involved in so many different things. Right. Um, I would say there really isn't a typical day. Um, probably 80, 90 percent of my time is managing the technology group. So a lot of it is sort of whatever's on fire metaphorically today. Um, so, for example, things like um, when COVID hit, um, we want so our telescope, the LDT, is in a you know remote location. It's an hour outside of Flagstaff. We've always had two people on site when it's operating for safety reasons. If someone you know injures themselves, we want to have someone else on site. And then COVID comes along. Well, we don't want our people working in close proximity to one another. Um, so these are you know completely mutually um, exclusive options. What do we do? Um, so some of it was developing the policies around that. So it turns out we can have our observer, our telescope operator in the room operating the telescope. We can have our observer remote, you know, from whatever partner they are. We have a, a remote observing facilities. There's actually one in my office right here. This four screen computer um, is how I track um, all the different uh, windows that I need when I'm observing with Express. Um, so uh, other facilities, other universities have remote observing facilities like that. Um, so I was getting some of those set up that happened during the pandemic. But then there was, if our astronomers remote and our telescope operators on site, who's gonna 
who's going to be the safety backup. So that means due to this safety tech program where we hired some people basically to be near the telescope, but not in the same room with the, the telescope operator. We have a, a, what we call the astronomer's lodge just down the hill from the telescope. It's less than a mile away. So we stationed our safety tech there and they're basically on Zoom all night with, with the telescope operator. And if they, you know, don't hear from them or, you know, they hear the hear you know, saying, oh God, my leg, my leg, they'll, you know, they can run up the hill. Unfortunately, we haven't had any significant incidents in the, the you know, two years of change we've been doing that. But that was, that's the sort of thing that I deal with as manager of the group. Um, and that, like I said, is maybe 90% of my time. And there's things like, okay, planning the new generation of instruments, working with our head of instrumentation to start, you know, where, do we, where are we going to go for funding? What kind of design for the instrument do we want? How much is it going to cost? So that's a lot of, that's the sort of thing I do on a day-to-day -day basis, but there's no, um, it really varies from day-to-day. -day. There is no regular day. And then um, the other bit of my time, I do the uh, observing for S5. I sometimes use this same remote observing facility to observe with the Anglo-Australian telescope um, in, in New South Wales, Australia. So I'll connect to them remotely or I'll use this to observe with Express. Um, and they also have my own technology research and development project. Um, we have what's called the Optics and Photonics Applications Laboratory, or OPAL, uh, here at Lowell. And that's uh, our, my colleague uh, Stephen Levine is working on the adaptive optics half of that. We eventually want to get adaptive optics on LDT to improve the quality of the, uh, the data um, and it, improve the instruments that we've got on there. And I'm working on a different technique to improve our performance, um, what's called OH suppression. So in the infrared, if you're looking from the ground up through the atmosphere, um, at about 70 kilometers up, there's a layer of um, OH molecules. So it's um, just like H2O is water. It's just, you, you strip off a, a hydrogen atom and you're left with the OH molecule. And those get, they absorb sunlight during the day. And then at night, they re-emit that light in the infrared. And so basically, if you're trying to observe in the infrared from the ground, you're looking through this forest, um, trying to see, you know, a leaf uh, a billion kilometers away when there's this entire forest in front of you blocking your view. So what this, this technique does is it uh, creates a notch filter. Um, so it reduces the light at the very specific narrow wavelengths at the colors of light that correspond to this emission from the atmosphere. So if we can knock out the atmospheric emission, the only thing we're left is um, this extremely distant light from the star or galaxy we're looking at. So it's it's another technique for reducing the background so we we get more more of the light we want and less of the light we don't. And so that's currently in the, the laboratory development stage. It involves um, microscopic um, rings etched into silicon wafers and we send the light from the telescope down a fiber through this silicon wafer and the light is absorbed in this this ring and then the rest of the light passes on and so there's still a lot of engineering to be done to turn this into a, a functional instrument that could go on a telescope and remove the background light from the from the atmosphere so that's, um, I don't get as much time as in the lab as I would like, but fortunately with the, the start and the, the funding of the, the OPAL, the uh, Optics and Photonics Applications Lab, we actually have staff who are dedicated to doing that. We have a research researcher who's you know, full-time in the lab now doing these projects. And so I'm helping to sort of oversee the project. I don't get to be in the lab, you know, turning knobs and um, running lasers and stuff every day, but I'm helping him to, to advance the project as well. So thanks, Thomas. So, so you're now at about 150% of time. Um, yeah. <laughs> And still adding things on. Um, can you um, explain a little bit about the adaptive optics? Because that's going to be, a, I mean, that's something that we've been looking at for a little while, right? Um, but it, how that's going to improve the quality of the performance right. of the telescope. So uh, I mentioned how the OH suppression works. This is um, 
a completely different method. So what it does is it basically measures, um, you can send a, a laser up into the sky or you can have a bright star near your target and you can measure how the atmosphere affects the light coming from that star or that that source of whatever sort. And you need really, you need a lot of computing power to do this. So effectively looking through the atmosphere is like looking through a swimming pool. You, if you look at the bottom of a swimming pool, the water um, distorts the light, um, it, it makes it sort of shimmer. And that's the same sort of thing that makes um, makes twinkling of, of planets and so on in the sky. And that um, basically that's because the light is being smeared out. We don't just get the light coming straight to us. <coughs> it's going through the atmosphere <clears throat> and being disturbed. So what we can do is we can measure the effects of that disturbance with the bright target and then say, okay, if the light is sort of bent in this way, you know, however the, the light is being misshapen as it comes through the atmosphere, let's take the mirror of our telescope or some, uh, some mirror in our optical path and bend it in exactly the opposite way. So if this bit of the light hits first, we move that bit of the mirror farther away. So the entire wavefront of the light is, is that uniform and flat, and that is basically correcting for the effects of the atmosphere um, by taking the, the, the way that the light is distorted by the atmosphere and doing the exact opposite distortion. And then it creates a, in principle, it creates a perfect image then of this star or galaxy or whatever you're looking at or I planet or comet or whatever. I think it'd be useful to just then define, um, we get this question a lot, you know, the observatory um, active optics, and that's yeah. not something that we use with this, but just define, you know, describe what that is. Okay. So adaptive optics uses enormous computing power. It has to change the shape of the mirror roughly 100 times a second, um, because that's how quickly the atmosphere changes above the telescope. So this, this required, uh, I mean, computers have been around for, for decades before they got fast enough and strong enough to do these computations. That's adaptive optics changing 100 times a second. Active optics just means that there's much slower scale changes. Like if the telescope is tracking across the sky, gravity is pulling on the mirror differently. So it's gonna change its shape just from gravity over the span of 15 minutes or something half an hour, an hour. And active optics changes much slower. It's, you know, one time a second or one time a minute or something like that. And that is, we have um, actuators in the back of our mirrors that can just push and pull a little bit on it, you know, a, a fraction of a millimeter. And that will uh, be enough to correct for, say, the sag in the glass due to the changing gravity vector as the mirror turns to follow a star. So that's that's um, doing the same sort of thing as adaptive optics, it's correcting uh, aberrations and correcting changes in the light. But this is from things like the change of gravity on the glass rather than uh, the effect of the atmosphere. And it's on an entirely different time scale. So what's, what's the margin of error with those, with those corrections? Um, so there are quantitative ways to describe this. Um, so the, the um, what quantity that astronomers measure is the point spread function of a source. So how far, how spread out is the light? In principle, a star is far enough away that it's just a single point of light. When it gets to our detector, it should land on you know one single pixel of our digital camera. Um, but the atmosphere spreads it out into, I don't know, maybe let's say five pixels. It spreads it out enough. Um, and then the adaptive optics can correct it down to maybe two or three pixels across. So that's the sort of scales we're talking about. It'll improve the, it'll smush the light down so it's in much fewer pixels so we can get a much more accurate 
you know, position and intensity and all the quantities we're trying to measure from this target because it's not, the light's not being squared out. So it's, I think that's, that's the right sort of scale going from say five pixels to two or three pixels is the sort of thing that adaptive optics is trying to do for if if you if you assume your target is a single pixel to begin with we have extended targets like planets we can look at jupiter and that's a, you know a big chunk of the detector real estate it's not just going to fit on one pixel but we can still correct um jupiter with adaptive optics as well in fact jupiter is interesting because it's so big you can actually do the correction um on Jupiter itself, you can, what's called close the loop, you can do this, you don't need another bright star by Jupiter, you can do the correction with Jupiter itself, and then you you can make the, the image much sharper. Um, it's a bit like, um, I don't want to use the wrong analogy, but it's a bit like, um, yeah, the correcting your vision. So you make your, your view much, much sharper of the object you're looking at. Um, if you sort of squint, you're blocking out some of the stray light um, and you can see you know, right, what's right at the center of your vision better. Um, and this is doing sort of, um, I don't know, maybe it's like LASIK for, for telescopes. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, we have about 10 minutes to go. And okay. so, we're going to take some more questions um, from the folks watching, and then there's actually kind of a, a mix of questions here. So you know, we'll just go through. I think we'll be able to get to most of them. Um, Jasmine um, refers to a science update news article about the Milky Way and um, Andromeda converging and eventually colliding. Um, what can you tell us about that? So I've talked about these dwarf satellite galaxies of the Milky Way, things that are much smaller, they're effectively building blocks, you know, individual bricks out of the whole building that is the Milky Way. Andromeda is roughly the same size as the Milky Way, maybe a little bit bigger. So that's gonna be like, that's not gonna be just adding a few bricks to the house. That's gonna be crashing another house into our house, into the Milky Way. Um, so that's gonna be significantly bigger. In fact, though, there's enough space between the stars in either galaxy that it's unlikely that any of the stars will physically run into each other. But just the gravity between the two will do the same thing to the Milky Way that the Milky Way is doing to these other smaller galaxies. So they'll, um, they'll eventually sort of um, merge into one great big elliptical galaxy. The Milky Way's um, sort of spiral arm structure will get disturbed and destroyed by its collision with Andromeda. So you'll be just left with one big milk dromeda is what I've heard it called. Um, but that won't happen for another billion or so years, a billion, two billion years from now. So Andromeda is far enough away. Um, but if you're around in a billion years, it'll look really, really big on the sky. It'll be starting to move into, you know, the, the Milky Way itself. It'll be much, much bigger than it is now because it's getting so much closer. It'll be starting to affect the gravity of you know, the Milky Way galaxy itself. Um, yeah, so individual stars will probably be okay and planets around those stars probably okay. Um, but the, the whole galaxy itself will be significantly disrupted. Yeah. So it's gonna be a while. We don't need to take out a galactic impact right. insurance. Right. No collision insurance at this point. <laughs> Let's talk about the, let's go back to the, um, some of the stars you're observing, the faint stars. Um, Cody asks, um, how old are these stars you're looking at? How old are the stars? Um, well, some of these galaxies formed, um, the Milky Way has been forming for a few billion years now. Um, so some of these, Ancient stars are, are well over a billion years old, I would say. Um, and what's interesting is we can tell sort of the, the sequential star formation of these. If we measure differences in chemical abundances in these different stars, we can say, oh, these formed first. They took maybe a million years to form. And then, you know, 10 million years later, these other stars formed from the supernova that came from these bigger stars and so on. So we can sort of get the, the history, but I would say we have different sort of star formation periods of a million or a few million years in duration, but they can be a billion years ago. 
I, I don't know exactly like uh, if we've dated um, when say this particular dwarf galaxy formed or whatever, but the sort of overall formation time scale of the Milky Way is on the order of billions of years. Mm -hmm. and, and regarding the stellar streams, how long to, does it take for those to form? Um, those will, um, yeah, that's again, sort of the same time scale. If we're getting these stars coming in to the Milky Way and building it up over a billion years, that's sort of the time scale we're talking about. And some of the other ones will orbit the Milky Way in, you know, maybe 10 million years. Some of them might be closer, but that's, you know, still in the, the tens of millions of years time scale for them to go all the way around and for the stars to get pulled out. So that's, yeah, that's the sort of time scale we're talking about. Tens of millions of years up to billions of years. Okay. We got about five more minutes, and so we'll um, do a couple more questions. Um, what's, what's the oldest thing that you observed yourself? So, um, the dark energy camera, where I, I'm still working on that project, we are looking at supernovae from more than halfway across the galaxy. So, the light left them when the universe was five, six billion years old. Um, so there, there, those stars aren't around anymore. We're now at 13.7 billion years old for the, the universe. So those that light is billions, like five, six, seven billion years old. We can see some galaxies that are even farther away than that. So um, yeah, the, the galaxy clusters we're looking at with the dark energy camera, um, five, eight, 10 billion years, something like that. Here's another question going back to the LDT. Um, you talked about um, starting to plan for future instruments. Um, can yeah. you just explain a little bit generally on what kind of instruments or what they'd be doing? So this is uh, kind of fun. We have the, I think you've talked about the instrument cube previously. We have this mount on the back of the telescope where the light goes off the primary mirror, secondary mirror, down through the hole in the primary to either the large monolithic imager, or we put another mirror in the way that sends light in any of the other four directions, sort of up, down, left, and right. We can put more instruments on the cube. We can swap out the existing ones. If the instrument sort of fits in that space on the back, we can put a fiber into what's called an auxiliary port we're calling this, uh, this is a new new one we came up with recently. Um, some of our instrumentation group, uh, Todd Bean and, and Ryan Hamilton did this. Um, they, if you can just pick off a, 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 enough light just to fill a single fiber, um, and then we can look at, um, we can send that light wherever we want. We can have a, the instrument, not even on the telescope at all. We just have the fiber running to wherever the instrument is on the telescope. So that's stuff we can do with the cube. We can, in principle, put an instrument up at what's called prime focus, where our secondary mirror is now. Instead of, we just put a camera up there, we'd have to take the secondary off. So we put the light up, it goes from the primary mirror straight to the camera. That is something that was initially considered um, for the original design and was scrapped in favor of the cube. But that is the sort of thing we're looking at. We can do that. It's uh, requires some big engineering changes to the telescope. Um, and then there's also we have these platforms on the side of the telescope that are called Naismith platforms. Um, and we can focus the light there if you want. So that would be a, an entirely different light path. Light off the primary mirror, secondary mirror, and then down to another corner mirror called, we call it the tertiary mirror that sends the light out the side of the telescope. And the advantage of the Naismith platforms is they're big, they're stable, they don't have to move around like the cube at the back of the telescope. So we can put really massive instruments there if we wanted um, something like with, you know, 10,000 fibers to look at 10,000 different galaxies at once. We could mount that on the Naismith platform. That's what a lot of other telescopes do for their big instruments. So really there's many, many different varieties of instruments we could do 
In some ways, the, the easiest and sort of the most likely first attempt will be just something else for the cube, um, some next generation instrument that that expands on the capabilities that we've been we've had for ten years. It's time to to upgrade. You know, we've got new technologies. Even if we just put something in the same space, we've got you know ten more years of of technology development to take advantage of. You know, we can do things like OH suppression or adaptive optics, um, but eventually we could we could you know really do something new and different and put you know instruments in a bunch of different places on the the telescope as well it's so exciting to think of all the research that's being done now but who knows down the road with all this these different instruments and how it's going to be used down the road so we'll look forward to to future programs to talk about all these discoveries yeah um, our, our science staff are just now going through um a sort of science vision staff what process what do we want to do um, all the way up through like 2050 so maybe you should talk to our director of science he can walk you through some of the ideas we've come up with for that yep in fact the last program of the year in december we're going to talk about the future of ldt excellent and so i think that'll be a fascinating talk and it, it looks like we're out of time i told you kyler this goes pretty fast yeah to get going it's it's just so great to hear about your research and and your work with um, not not just the research, but instrumentation mm -hmm. and everything you do to make, make it all work. Thanks for joining us. And thanks, Thank thanks for those who are watching for joining and taking an interest in Loeb Observatory and the Loeb Observatory Telescope. And thank you to those folks who donated um, tonight, helping support um, the work of our researchers and our educators here at Loeb Observatory. You and definitely we, can't do all this uh, research and technology development, development without the, that support. So yes, thank you. Yes, and thanks everybody for joining us and thanks Maddie and Nate for making everything work behind the scenes. Um, that's it for tonight. Thanks everybody for joining us and we'll see you next time.